Welcome to Teleforum, a podcast of the Federal Society's practice groups. I'm Dean Reuter, Vice President, General Counsel, and Director of Practice Groups at the Federal Society. For exclusive access to live recordings of practice group Teleforum calls, become a Federal Society member today at fedsoc.org. Welcome, everyone, to the Federal Society's Teleforum conference call. As this afternoon, December 15, 2020, we have a special courthouse steps decision teleforum on United States v. Briggs. I'm Nick Marr, Assistant Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that expressions of opinion on today's call are those of our experts. We're very fortunate to have with us two experts who covered the oral arguments in this case uh, just about a month or two ago. Our first one guest today is Arthur Reiser, he's Director Criminal Justice and Civil Liberties, and Resident Senior Fellow at the R Street Institute. We're also joined by Professor Richard Sala. He's Assistant Professor of Law at Vermont Law School. Um, After Arthur and uh, Professor Sala give their remarks covering the case, we'll open up the floor to audience questions. So we'll be looking to you at that time. All right, without much more delay, Professor Sala, thanks for being with us. Uh, I'll hand the floor off to you. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you for uh, the introduction. And I'm just going to get us started um, by uh, just recapping United States versus Briggs. So United States versus Briggs is consolidated with United States versus Collins and United States versus Humphrey Daniels. Uh, And in each of these cases, a military member, in this case um, from the United States Air Force, is accused, tried, and convicted of rape at general court-martial. Each of the trials takes place well after the rape occurred, ranging between eight years and 17 years after the rape occurred. Uh, And really to understand uh, how we get to United States versus Briggs, uh, we have to take a brief look back to a 2018 case, uh, United States versus Mangahas. Um, Mangahas was a 2015 prosecution of a rape that was committed in 1997. And it was appealed to the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. Uh, it was appealed to CAF. Uh, and in that, in that case, CAF decides that COCA v. Georgia um, is applicable in the military context. And, and this becomes significant because uh, Congress had devised a framework in the Uniform Code where all crimes punishable by death could be prosecuted at any time. And all other crimes, with some exceptions, are going to be subject to a five-year statute of limitations. After Mangahas, even though the Uniform Code of Military Justice says rape is punishable by death, Uh, It's essentially discounted under the theory that because you can't, as a result of Coker v. Georgia, employ the death penalty as a punishment for rape, uh, the time bar reverts to that five-year statute of limitations. Um, And so let me very briefly kind of work through the Uniform Code. Uh, So Article 18 of the Uniform Code uh, gives general court martial, the general court's martial jurisdiction over individuals that are subject to the code for Uniform Code of Military Justice Offenses, um, which include crimes punishable by death. Uh, when it's specifically authorized by the code. Article 43 sets out the statute of limitations. And as I said earlier, uh, the statute of limitation uh, offenses uh, punishable by death can be tried and punished at any time. And then everything else else is essentially subject to that five-year statute of limitations. Uh, Finally, we look to the punitive article, which is Article 120. It's the rape offense, um, which states uh, uh, specifically states that it shall be punished by death or such other punishment as the court-martial may direct. Um, and so, again, the upshot of the Court of Appeal for the Armed Forces decision in Mangahas is that the rape prosecution uh, is now subject to the five-year statute of limitations. Um, at the time that Mangahas is decided, United States versus Collins is before the Air Force Court of Criminal Appeals. Um, that court applies Mangahas, uh, and Collins, uh, Collins's prosecution is time-barred. The Air Force Judge Advocate General certifies the issue for appellate review, um, but while they're awaiting the appeal to CAF, CAF confirms Mangahas in a, in a case called United States versus Briggs um, uh, and confirms the Air Force uh, Court of Criminal Appeals in Collins. Um, uh, subsequently, the, the Air Force Court of Criminal Appeals reverses the conviction of Humphrey, Humphrey Daniels because, the, again, the prosecution is time barred uh, and the government appeals to the Supreme Court of the United States uh, to basically answer the following question, which we addressed in the last podcast, which is whether the United States Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces aired in concluding, contrary to its own longstanding precedent, that the UCMJ, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, allows prosecution of a rape that occurred between 1986 and 2006, only if it was discovered and charged within five years. Um, and so uh, moving on to uh, the, the release of the opinion, to, to kind of sum up 
the arguments that were advanced and addressed by the court, uh, and there were some that weren't, which Arthur will touch on later, but to sum up the arguments advanced and addressed by the court, uh, respondents contended that the phrase punishable by death in Article 43 means capable of punishment by death when all applicable law is taken into account, and right, including the Eighth Amendment. Uh, whereas the government sees the phrase punishable by death as meaning capable of punishment by death under the penalty provisions of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Um, and so Justice Alito uh, uh, writes, delivers the opinion of the unanimous court in favor of the government and basically um, setting out uh, uh, three reasons uh, for favoring the government's interpretation. And he starts by noting uh, that, that uh, dictionary definitions of punishable um, lend some validity to the respondent's arguments. Uh, but, but he goes on to say that definitions in, uh, here um, aren't going to answer the question, the, the, the question of um, punishable under what law, right? So, um, and so uh, the, the court then goes on to provide some context um, beyond those, those definitions, those, those dictionary definitions, um, and, and then goes on to um, say that these three reasons weigh heavily in favor of the government. And so the first point that, that the court lays out in its opinion is that a, a natural referent or statute of limitations provision within the Uniform Code of Military Justice is the Uniform Code of Military Justice itself. And so uh, as an example, the court notes that no one would read Article 43's reference to offenses to include those um, under state law. It's a reference to offenses in the Uniform Code. Uh, the court also notes that many crimes uh, included the, the punishable by death language in the Uniform Code. Uh, and, and, and Justice Alito says, presumably, to save from including the long list of, of offenses punishable by death in, in Article 43, Congress just said, if it's punishable by death in the punitive articles, um, there's not going to be a time bar. Everything else is five years. Um, and, the, and the court specifically notes this is going to be true uh, if provisions even if uh, provisions elsewhere in the code might provide a defense against uh, the imposition of the death penalty. So um, that's the, the first prong of, of Justice Alito's opinion, uh, and I'll hand it off uh, to Arthur uh, for that second prong. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I, I just tap in a little bit on what uh, uh, Richard said. One of the things that I thought was really interesting is they really drill down on the word uniform. And that's something that Richard um, pointed out. And, uh, you know, it's called the UCMJ for a reason. Um, and they intended it specifically as an inclusive um, overhaul of how justice was to be administered in the armed forces. So it was interesting that they they really uh, uh, focused on the word uniform um, to make their case, and and, and rightly so. Um, I, another area that I, I, I uh, another point uh, that Alito wrote was specifically about you know the goals of the statute uh, limitations and. And he wrote that one of the goals of the statute of limitations is clarity. In fact, it could be the paramount um, goal that all others kind of rest upon. And when Congress wrote the UCMJ, they would have undermined the goal of clarity by basing its application on future Supreme Court jurisprudence. So it, it, think about that. It's, a, it's an unusual stance from the Supreme Court to basically um, clip their own wings. And I'll say it again, when Congress you know, wrote the UCMJ, they would have undermined the goal of clarity uh, as it relates to the statute of limitation by basing its applicability on future Supreme Court jurisprudence. So therefore, it is unlikely that Congress would have forsaken the goal of clarity by intending it to be open for forces of extra UCMJ jurisprudence. So it, it, the first two points almost wrap around on each other, exactly what uh, Professor Solomon is talking about. We know when Article 43A, um, which states there is no statute of limitations for these particular crimes, um, was written, uh, the UCMJ is uniform, and it, it is unlikely that Congress would have um, forsaken its own goals um, as it relates to statutes of limitations by uh, leaving um, extra UCMJ jurisprudence to be uh, uh, decided and formed later. Um, and if you look at, and, and if you watch, and I highly recommend that you do, um, the, 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 the same presentation that Richard and I did a few months ago, uh, ago on the oral arguments, you can almost see this um, coming. You can see the questions they were asking um, to specifically uh, kind of foreshadow 
what uh, their decision was going to be. Okay, the, the, another point um, that I think is important is the underpinnings of the statute of limitations and those of cruel and unusual punishment uh, clause do not overlap. Um, and that was another, uh, and probably the third point that, that Leo made. Uh, you know, when statutes of limitations concern the difficulty of putting together a case and um, presenting a prosecution, the cruel and unusual uh, punishment clause concerns you know, really depending on, on who you ask, but this is what Alito, I believe, was saying was either, the, you know, the evolving standard of decency or original intent. And so if you if you if you run um, those kind of overarching ideals through this case, um, the, 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 the court basically says that. Um, or Lito, you know, specifically says that it is uh, the government wins. So one, the, the last thing that I'm going to talk about before turning it back over, um, uh, so we can talk about, you know, what Gorsuch um, uh, added to this. But um, one of the arguments that the majority did not resolve, which I thought I thought was particularly interesting, um, because it 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 almost seems like they're adding a hole to be um, um, addressed later on. But the CAF previously held um, that Article 55, uh, that's the UCNJ's own prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment. Remember, the UCNJ basically takes everything that we think about um, uh, and, and, you know, civilian life constitutional standards and then codifies it. So, you know, the Miranda um, rights are codified within the UCNJ. Um, and so, uh, you know, in essence, Brady um, is codified within the UCNJ. So Article 55 is the UCNJ's prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment um, was to be afforded as much protection as the Eighth Amendment. So that, that is a previous uh, decision um, by CAF, that's U.S. versus, um, is it Wappler? Is that the right, um, Richard? I think it is. Um, it's W-A-P-B-L-E-R. Um, and the majority dismissed this by, by basically stating that, that, that article, um, uh, you know, direct permission of the death penalty for rape is to be the most natural place to look for Congress's answer to whether or not rape was punishable by death within the meeting of, uh, of Article 43A in the first place. So therefore, the court says that they don't need to decide whether or not Eighth Amendment applies through Article 55 of the UCNJ. So you know, there is some room um, for more d d d you know, things to be cited um, uh, later on. But, you know, with an eight to zero decision, um, in, in essence, uh, in favor of the government, well, it depends on how you count seven, uh, one, depending on where you want to put Gorsuch on that, which Professor Stiles is going to talk about. Um, it, it, this was a really clear um, decision and really clear um, a jurisprudence that, that I think will give clear guidance to the military. And that's something else that we, we talked about in the last teleform. You know, one of the themes that you're going to see always when it relates to UCMJ is ensuring there's bright line rules because ultimately the military's goal is not to, to, to decide um, what is right or wrong here in the, in the comfort of uh, you know U.S. courtrooms, but it's decide what is uh, right or wrong um, in, in, during the horrors of war. And so we need to be have very clear rules and guidance about what we're telling our young men and women who um, put on the uniform. So um, I, I think, you know, what we're going to talk about now is, uh, is how Gorsuch added his fingerprints to this. And then a few other notes uh, that uh, Professor Sal and I are going to add um, to the end. Thanks a lot, Arthur. Appreciate it. Um, so we'll just take one uh, brief moment to uh, address the very, very short one paragraph uh, dissent laid out by Justice Gorsuch, who, again, uh, as Arthur noted, it is an, an 8 0 opinion uh, because Justice Gorsuch um, agrees with the, the court's decision on the merits, um, and uh, Justice Barrett doesn't take, uh, uh, doesn't participate in the opinion. Um, but uh, Justice Gorsuch does give us one paragraph, essentially saying that he continues to believe that the court lacks jurisdiction uh, to hear appeals directly from the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. I mean, this is at least a little bit interesting because uh, while Justice Alito writes the opinion uh, in this case, um, he also wrote um, the dissent uh, in a case in 2018, Ortiz versus the United States, um, where, where Justice uh, Alito in that dissent basically says, um, you know, these are executive branch officers. These are these they are not wielding, um, you know, Article three. Uh, power and, and so um, uh, they can't exercise the federal government's judicial power, and, and that fact uh, basically um, would compel the court to dismiss, in that case, Ortiz's peti petition for lack of jurisdiction. Uh, and, and Justice Gorsuch just gives us an opinion, uh, excuse me, a paragraph 
um, to uh, reiterate uh, the dissent in Ortiz, which Justice uh, Gorsuch also joined, saying um, there's an issue with jurisdiction here. Um, but at least um, at least uh, six other members of the court here believe there is jurisdiction. Uh, and again, uh, Justice Gorsuch joins the opinion, uh, the court's decision on the merits. Um, so with that, I'll turn it uh, back over to Arthur. Yeah, so um, kind of some closing uh, thoughts and, and comments. You know, if, if you guys listened to the uh, the last tell forum, we were right. I am vindicated. We both predicted uh, a decision in favor of the government. Um, I predicted a 6-2 uh, in favor uh, based on specifically on statutory grounds. And I think that prediction pretty much um, came to fruition um, with the court only addressing this on statutory grounds and punting on the Eighth Amendment problem, which is, uh, I think, exactly what um, we predicted. I mean, the main difference is that the 6-2 uh, prediction turned into an 8-0. And so, you know, I think some of my closing thoughts on this um, are, I think this this decision really leads credence to the, the quote from uh, Justice Kagan some years ago that we are all textualists um, now. And I, I, I see this as not only something a, a theme that we're going to see, uh, obviously, we just saw in this case, I think it's something you're going to see kind of um, in the Supreme Court for years to come. Um, you know, less, less, you know, decisions based on emotion, what's happening right now, and, and more based on what is the what is the text. Um, uh, I, I would be surprised if we saw the court address whether or not the Eighth Amendment um, uh, applies directly uh, to the uh, UCMJ in, in the next few years. Um, they can always sidestep big decisions on statutory grounds. Uh, but if this or some other case like it works its way up to the court again, um, they don't have much room to run away from the, th that issue. So I, I, I predict that if they don't want to address that, they're just not going to pick it up. Um, and uh, that is my uh, prediction over the next you know, five or six years. Uh, Richard, do you have any um, kind of parting thoughts for our our listeners who um, have so um, graciously given us their time. Uh, very briefly, I'll just say uh, I, I was also glad to, 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 uh, to see that we got it right. Um, it came out in, in favor of the government, although I, I will admit that I expect I did think there was a chance that we would see um, more discussion of the Eighth Amendment issue. if not in the opinion in, the, in a concurrence, but we didn't see that. Um, nevertheless, uh, interesting case. And, and, and like Arthur, I think um, – uh, the opportunities to address the Eighth Amendment issue in the military context are going to be few and far between. So I would expect this to carry us along for, for quite some time. Yeah. So we are uh, willing and ready for questions. We we went through that uh, quicker than we expected. Um, and uh, we're happy to talk about anything that you all want to want to discuss. Great. Let's open up the floor to audience questions. So we have two questions in the queue right now, but we'll go to our first question now. Uh, hey, thanks so much for the uh, overview of the case. Uh, this is Herb Ford. I'm the general counsel for Concerned Vets for America and a former JAG. Uh, not many Supreme, not many military cases get to Supreme Court, so it's great to see you guys um, analyze this one. So it, my, my main question, I guess, is, is this. Do you see this as essentially a, a clear textual application that is do you see the, the justices simply reading the text that Congress um, has enacted in the UCMJ and, and Article 34, as opposed to um, a, a legal analysis? Is this clearly a textual analysis of, this, of these, these facts and circumstances? Um, and uh, yeah, I'll hold for your, your response. Thanks. Yeah, that's the way that I read it. Um, and if you look at the, I think that the, the reason that I say that is if you look at the, you know, this is what, what Richard went over. If you look at Alito's kind of first point, you know, and they, and they specifically talk about Article 3, uh, you know, 43, which states there is no statute of limitations for crimes punishable by death. Um, and when they interpreted that, um, it, it should be done so with the UCMJ and not by looking at other external texts. Um, such as the Eighth Amendment, um, per se, which, you know, uh, might say punish, punishment by death for rape cases is unconstitutional. And the, the, the word that they latched on and, and, and which, you know, is, is very simple and easy for them, um, is the word uniform. Um, and it was intended as an inclusive overhaul on how all justice was to be administered in the United States. And you don't need to look any further. It's all right there on the text. And you don't need to look at anything else. So that's the way that I 
um, saw it. I don't know if Richard has a, a different opinion or not. I don't think it's a, a lot of difference. I, I do, you know, I did see it as a little bit more than strictly textual just because, uh, again, Justice Alito starts out on, in the opinion um, looking to, you know, Webster's Third New International Dictionary and so on and so forth. And, and what a lot yeah. of those um, yeah. definitions turned on was, you know, I'll just give you an example, right? Deserving of or liable to punishment capable of being punished by law or right, right? So I think if we applied that strictly um, without context, uh, maybe the respondent's argument gains a little more traction. So I, I, I certainly think it's textual in that it's based on the reading of the uniform code, um, maybe not uh, on, on not turning on that specific word, but understanding in context that when the statute refers to this chapter and so on and so forth, that really having to put all the pieces of the code together and not focus on just one or two articles. Yeah, I think another uh, reason that I feel that way, and, and this could be just my own biases kind of uh, playing out is, you know, if you look at, you know, I read, I, I, I'm pretty sure I read every Supreme Court case that, that that has come out since I've been an attorney. So for the last 20 years, I think I've read every Supreme Court case at some point. And if you look at cases that are, are, are what I would call a textual case, they're like this, they're short. Um, they don't have to get really deep into the facts. They don't do really deep historical analysis of, of legal ideas. They're in, they're out, they're to the point. I mean, I think that we saw, uh, you know, my, where I teach as a professor, um, George Mason named after, you know, Scalia, he was a, uh, an expert at, at, at that type of, of legal decisions. And, you know, and so that's maybe because it's so short, that's, that's the, you know, kind of overarching impression, um, that I got, but I think Richard is made a really good point. They, they did um, do some, you know, uh, you know, almost word analysis in many ways to, uh, to, you know, almost short circuit the, um, uh, the, 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 the argument from the other side. Um, and I think that is uh, obviously there. So I, yeah, I, I definitely agree that uh, there is some of that as Richard pointed out, but I still see this as a, uh, a, a kind of pure, you know, textualist, um, um, purish. How about that textualist uh, decision? Yeah, like thanks. And just a, a follow up to that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so Congress actually amended that that article, right? And so, since uh, you know the early two thousands, so these are cases that precede that amendment, right? So that, and that, currently, that's correct. So the, the amendment, the 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 the, uh, the, t the statute of limitation has has been amended. So we wouldn't see this in this way again. Uh, the, the 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 punitive article, the one twenty article, is is no longer. There's no question as to whether right. it's time barred. It's not time barred. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, I'm a big fan of your organization, by the way. Um, thanks for for listening. Appreciate it. Sure thing. Great. We'll go to our next question now. Yes, this is uh, David Burge in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm a wholly civilian lawyer, so this is a new area for me. Uh, I know the court ducked the constitutional issues, but in the previous cases that you have read, are military defendants treated the same on constitutional issues, or do they tend to get a—I know the Constitution is the same for, for all citizens, but is, it, are they, is the approach somewhat different in the court's uh, treatment, uh, treatment of these cases? Uh, that's a um, great question. Um, yeah. Do you want to go first, Arthur? I, I mean, Richard was a jag, so I'm gonna let him uh, go over that. The only thing I would say is, if there's been uh, literature written about this, that in fact the, uh, the the military has been ahead in every single category of constitutional protections. The military offered those protections first. So if you, in Miranda rights, you know, long before uh, there were uh, the Miranda decision came out. Um, the, the UCMJ, the military was offering the same types of, 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 of protection. So, um, it is really is ahead of the curve. And I, I, I don't think you can point to a single thing that we would look at today as a benchmark constitutional protection in the criminal case that the military didn't do first, um, which is surprising. That actually surprises a lot of people, but, um, I can, I think I can prove it if you gave me examples and I had enough time to do research. Um, but, but yeah, but Richard was a, a JAG officer and retired as a JAG officer. So he's going to have a better insight in, in, in the inside baseball on that, on that. So I'll turn it over to him. I'll, I'll just be brief because uh, I think trying to catalog them all would would take a long time. But th there are some small diff there are some differences um, with the the the, the UCMJ approach um, 
and, and the, the constitutional issues that arise. I'll just give you one example. Um, recently, uh, you had uh, the case, uh, the Supreme Court decide Ramos versus Louisiana, which which oh, yeah. um, concluded that um, that that um, there was the unanimous jury requirement uh, for convictions. Uh, the military does not have a unanimous jury requirement. So the uniform code, uh, I believe, um, uh, when I was practicing was two thirds. I think it's been changed to three fourths now. Um, uh, but that's just at least one example of a protection that's a little bit different for um, people subject to the uniform code uh, as opposed to uh, their civilian counterparts. Uh, ho- hopefully that at least touches or answers your question a little bit. Yeah, and, and, and the one thing to keep in mind is if you read, you have to read the UCMJ through the lens of war fighting. That is the entire Everything in the UCMJ is supposed to support the idea that um, the military is different and there, there needs to be a different set of rules. But there is this constant kind of drumbeat that um, uh, despite that, you know, we, you know, we're a great nation and we're a great nation because we provide constitutional protections even when it's hard. Um, and there's nothing harder than doing that um, in, in the field of combat. Um, you know, I, I'm, I am, I'm not a JAG, but I'm a, a combat veteran, served in Iraq, uh, tail end battle Fallujah. And, and I, I, I personally witnessed um, um, a constant professionalism from uh, uh, the you know criminal justice professionals in theater um, and the soldiers and Marines that I dealt with. Uh, rights were were the utmost um, concern. Um, that's a great question, though. Thank you for uh, for calling in and listening. Yeah, I, I think I just want to add one brief thing to that, Arthur, which is um, uh, you know. There is a legit. I think there's a. I think, at least I think there's a legitimate question about how the Eighth Amendment um, would apply to service members. And, and like Arthur um, just alluded to, there's there's plenty of uh, literature out there talking about the, the military being a unique society. It's one of the reasons um, we don't enjoy the exact same First uh, Amendment rights um, that our civilian counterparts do. Right? There's questions about military necessity, about good order and discipline. Um, and so, um, so if you think about, uh, for instance, Coker v. Georgia, which which says um, that the death penalty can't be applied uh, to an individual convicted of of rape uh, of of an adult woman, um, then we think about well, if the if the military is a, a little bit of a is a different society or different, you know, would they would they have the same evolving societal sense of decency? Uh, for example, um, uh, and I believe uh, Justice Alito, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Arthur, but I think Justice Alito alludes to this during oral argument when he says, um, "What if someone uh, essentially went on a rape spree uh, in the yeah. in the combat zone, but but didn't kill someone? Um, would they be subject to uh, the death penalty, or, or would Coker v. Georgia apply?" So I think those are the kinds of things we would be wrestling with if we had reached the Eighth Amendment issue, which which we didn't here. Yeah. I would assume another. You know, I assume desertion is probably still a death penalty offense, and you know that would raise that would be an interesting question. Should that come up again? Yeah, the court actually—that's not, that's, that's not murder. The court actually lays out uh, 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 several in the opinion: mutiny and sedition, misbehavior before the enemy. Uh, um, uh, subordinate compelling compelling surrender, uh, aiding the enemy. I mean, there, there are several. So uh, d- definitely, uh, uh, Eighth Amendment issues uh, to be considered there. Right, thank yeah. you. Yes, sir. So we don't have any callers in the queue right now. Uh, if you'd I'll like ask to ask a question to, uh, to, uh, for it, uh, Richard. Yeah, Richard, is, was there anything here that surprised you from from being a you know a former prosecutor? Um, in the in the Marine Corps, was there anything in the um, either the oral arguments, um, the briefs uh, that I know you and I both read or hear that that su- surprised you and made you feel that there was a um, uh, knowledge gap between those, you know, the people who make decisions and make law and those who actually have to be out in the field um, and, and do all the soldiering and do all the marining? Um, and I'm just I'm more curious about your personal um, kind of feeling towards it. Ah, that's a great question. Now I have to spend a second thinking about it. Um, I I wouldn't say I was um, was that surprised uh, overall. I think I think the one that was that I spent the most time thinking about was from the I think believe from the respondents' brief, um, where essentially it, 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 um, we, they, uh, it appears to me that they they try to treat um, different kind of rape different kinds of rape differently under Coker v. Georgia, right? So. Um, there are some, um, you know, where um, if it's if there's a rape that happens kind of 
in the continental United States on the base that might be treated one way. But if there's one that happens in the combat zone, um, it might be charged uh, as a war crime. Um, and, and I, uh, um, so that was that one um, I spent the most time wrestling with because, um, I, you know, I, at least as I was thinking about it, I was thinking you'd want kind of a uniform approach to this kind of thing. Um, or we end up again with the question of um, whether or not the, the Eighth Amendment applies uh, the same way to the military as it does uh, to the civilian counterpart. So that, that was the one I wrestled with the most. But um, uh, I think the out- outcome here is pretty straightforward. Um, uh, based on a lot of a lot of considerations that I think, you know, um, uh, prosecutors um, uh, would appreciate, you know, just about when the statute of limitations um, is going to be, how long do we have um, to to work with the victim? Uh, how long do we have to try to gather evidence and the investigating that goes on? Um, what, do, what do we do um, when someone comes to us years later to make a report and so on? And not, not just for, by the way, not just for prosecutors and lawyers, but for commanders, right? For those convening authorities uh, who have to make these tough kinds of decisions um, without the benefit, really, of, of, a, of a, a, a juris doctor. So, um, yeah, hopefully, I, hopefully uh, somewhere in there, Arthur, I yeah. answered your question. And I, I guess one more I had for you was, do you when you read Gorsuch's opinion, I, I haven't heard of this idea that CAF doesn't fall into the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. I never even knew there was an argument out there. I, I guess I see that he cited the Orts um, um, case, but is that something that you've like heard about that that there is this theory from uh, you know uh, jurists that that cap that the Court of Armed Forces uh, doesn't even fall under the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court? Um, so I, I, I actually remember uh, when Ortiz came out, um, and uh, that was uh, one of the first times I heard it. But I also want to say that if you go back um, into the various um, filings and pleadings and, and so on and so forth with the Supreme Court, um, that the respondents actually raised this early on, and, and it just yeah. didn't gain any traction. Yeah, I actually kind of blew it off. I now think about it. I, when, I, when I saw that, I was like, okay, they're just throwing – you know, darts at a, at a wall blindfolded. But um, when to see Gorsuch write it out like that, I was like, oh, there's there's some serious thinkers that actually believe this. That's as really interesting. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's great. Essentially, I mean, they're Article Two courts. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, cool. Nick, do we have anybody else? No one in the queue right now. So I'll give a chance for uh, closing remarks. If we get a question, I'll let you know. But otherwise, we'll wrap up a bit early this afternoon. Yeah, I already gave my closing uh, remarks, um, <laughs> so I'm I'm good. You don't have to, uh, just if you want to. I'll just close. I guess I could just close up by saying uh, I was uh, glad to fall in on a teleform with only a 12 page opinion, and I hope to see more of them in the future. There you go. Well, thank you for all for joining us today, and on behalf of the Federalist Society, I want to thank uh, you, Arthur and Richard, our experts, for the benefit of your valuable time and expertise this afternoon. To our audience for calling in, and thanks for your great questions. Um, as always, we welcome your feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. And be keeping an eye on your emails and our website for announcements about upcoming teleform calls and virtual events. Uh, join us tomorrow at noon Eastern time for a virtual panel um, on court reform proposals and discussions. Uh, so register for that on our website. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We are adjourned. Thank you for listening to this episode of Teleform, a podcast of the Federalist Society's practice groups. For more information about the Federalist Society, the practice groups, and to become a Federalist Society member, please visit our website at fedsoc.org.